Hello! Today we are with Matt Reed. Matt Reed is like a lot of my audience. He's a pretty young dude uh, <laughs> who likes video games and likes Kerbal Space Program, uh, but has taken it to the next level. Can you tell the world what you've been up to recently? Uh, well, for the past year and a bit, I've been building my own uh, satellite in my uh, in my bedroom. You put together a small thing called the Ardu Orbiter, which is an Arduino-based uh, mm -hmm. microsatellite, right? Yeah, yeah. And uh, Ardu Orbiter One. Ardu cool. Orbiter One. And how big is this thing? Oh uh, well, it will fit in this structure here. Uh, it's about a this is a two-inch cube, so it works just by uh, a few circuit boards. So we've got that one and this one. And they just stack on top of each other, uh, like that. Let's be clear, this is one-eighth of the size of a regular cube set. You can fit eight of those yeah. into that. So this is this is getting smaller and smaller still, which mm. uh, means it'll presumably be cheap to launch or get on some launch, right? Uh, yeah, it's actually only about 18,000 euros to launch it. That's still a chunk it, of change. It's a lot. So companies can sponsor me to do this. If you sponsor the launch, you get your logo on the bottom of this. There will be a camera on the satellite which deploys it. Uh, and then you have your logo in space. With Floating the away backdrop. in space, yes. Yeah. That, that's cool. Nice video. So, I mean, you've always been interested in electronics then? or um, No, this is my first electronics project. Your first electronics? When did you start building electronics? Well, um, I guess if you want to talk about when I started well, taking interest in electronics... Uh, I built my first computer when I was 11. Okay. Uh, and that was, you know, it, it's... What did you build that computer for? Just gaming, pretty much. Gaming? What Kerbal games? Or less. Kerbal, huh? I mean, you are... Let's be clear. How old are you? Uh, I'm 15 now. Fif but, uh, 15? Good Lord! I am... Oh, God. My, my life is such a failure in comparison. No, this is amazing. But, I mean, this is, hasn't even got to the core. The, the reason why I ended up talking to you is you designed this satellite, you published it as a project, and you entered it into a competition, right? Uh, yeah, the Google Science Fair. So. The Google Global Science oh, yeah. Fair. Uh, anyone from around the world can enter it. Yeah, about 4,000 entries, more than 4,000 actually in that this year. And uh, they chose 20 of them. And about 20 being thrown out to California, uh, San Francisco. And uh, the grand prize is a, I think it's a $50,000 scholarship. So that's you going through uh, university pretty well. Right, but so, so let me get this clear, right? A pro process of events. You built a computer to play games. Mm -hmm. You played Kerbal Space Program and thought, hey, I like spaceships. Let's try applying some of these PC building skills to building a spaceship. <laughs> Oh, uh, and yeah. by the way, now you're one of the 20 finalists worldwide at the Google Global Science Fair. I mean, I'm not trying to make you feel, like, amazing, but that's pretty amazing. Yeah, I, I guess you could put it like that. I mean, oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I mean, I, I know what I was doing at that age, and it wasn't building satellites. So if you're going to launch this tomorrow, what kind of uh, instrumentation would you add to this basic core? This satellite, the one I'm going to be launching in 2017, I think. It's going to be very basic. It is pretty much just going to be these uh, two boards, which has a thermometer in the uh, 18 mega chip, and it transmits radio data. Now, the reason I'm doing that is because if I have a really expensive satellite with tons of stuff on it, it's more likely to fail. If that happens, then people are going to say, oh, satellites always have to be expensive. I don't want that to happen. I want to have you know, low-cost satellites so anyone can build one. Uh, the total electronics cost of the satellite is, you know, it's about including everything, you know, the, the solar panels, the electronics is uh, $150, or less than that, actually. That's, uh, so buy cell phones for that price, you know? Oh, yeah. yeah. And then play or spaceship you, or games buy on a satellite. Them. Or you could buy a satellite, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, that's a, that is really cool. You know, it just occurred to me, if you can make it small enough, you could put it inside a golf ball-sized enclosure and have a Russian knock it off of the space station as a launch system. There's an idea for you. Yeah, I guess. <laughs> He's like, oh, no, I don't want to re-engineer my electronics. But... So, I mean, what you've, you've published is not... You haven't just built this yourself, but you've provided the designs, the software, you know, everything made it all available to anybody else that wants to do it. Like I said, it's my first electronics project, so I, I don't know too much about electronics, but I know this works, so I'm going for the simple. 
you know, it's an Arduino, so there's tons and tons of example code available. For instance, a, a software running on this radio, uh, it's all example software. And so the ground station, how do you get stuff back from a ground station? What kind of hardware do you use for that? Uh, this is the ground station. Okay. It's, an, uh, it's uh, just an Arduino Uno with a uh, RFM 22B shield on top of it. You know, I'm going to put a better antenna on it than this. But yeah, I, I, how big an antenna do you need to pick up data from a five, you know, five centimeter sal satellite? Well, uh, it can be done on a, a Yagi antenna, uh, which is just like a standard TV antenna for most yeah. people, right? But you have to point that at the, the yeah, location, satellite. right? Yeah, and then it will send down all the data. I'm fairly fortunate in the fact that uh, Surrey Space Center or Surrey University uh, are letting me use their antennas. I've been at it's pretty advanced, you know, ve well, very advanced software and hardware, all kinds of stuff they got there. Uh, so I can use that stuff to pick up transmissions on this. Or anyone can really pick it up. It's uh, very simple and easy and, to do. Yeah, and you just have to wait until it's in the right place. So you'd have to know the orbit then get your stuff pointed directly at it. And I guess we're fortunate that um, most of these things get launched off of the ISS these days, right? Um, kind of. I mean, this is going to be launched off uh, old Russian ICBM. Oh, okay. So that, that one... <laughs> so, I mean, it has but to be... It, you're in the UK. It has to be in a relatively high inclination orbit, right? It's going to put in a... Um, oh, I think about 620 kilometer orbit polar. The way this gets launched, it's an old ICBM. Yeah. Uh, it's the most powerful one the Russians had in their fleet at the time. But it's now being used to launch satellites. Yeah, they get a so ton of those left. That's oh, it. Yeah. That is, you know, that is really fascinating thing. And I, whoa! Yes. Oh no, it's broken. Launch pre-launch disaster. <laughs> that that looks pretty Major tough. Aluminium. Air grade aluminium. Yeah, uh, yeah. Glad you know how to pronounce that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna just come back because my audience likes games and you you play Kerbal Space Program then? You said you played it a lot, or you thought it was an inspiration? That's how we learned, you know, basics of space flight. Oh well, it's the only way I know space flight pretty much. It wouldn't be correct to say that it didn't inspire me to do something like this. Building uh stuff in Kerbal, it, you know, it, it's fun. It's fun, but it's not actual satellites, so no, I thought, yeah, why not? Yo, uh, cubes out surfing, why not? So you go after the real, the real deal. You got one hit, and then you needed a more, a more realistic experience, right? What's the coolest thing you did, or the most impressive thing you think? Well, for me, it's landing on Juno. But did you get get the crew back? It was a lander. Oh, oh, it was, oh okay. no, no, it wasn't. No, wait, I've launched about three things to Juno so far. Uh, and no, the crew stayed there. Oh, okay. So it was Mars 1, but not yeah, necessarily so was, deliberate. Yeah. <laughs> and also, they always hit the poles for some reason. There's probably an underlying reason why that happens, but we always hit the ball. Well, they're easy to see. You know, if you're going to pick a landing site, land at the white stuff. Okay, so anyway, you're going to be coming to uh, San Francisco in a couple of weeks, and uh, yeah. hopefully, you know, hopefully the judges find your project to be awesome. I hear it's like only one of two... Uh, space yeah. things, uh, space satellites or whatever in the group. Unfortunately, the call quality started to drop off after this, and uh, you know, I wasn't really able to finish this or get any more details. Uh, we, we talked about tracking the satellite with NORAD and things like this. However, really what you should take away from this is that video games can in fact teach you real life science. They can inspire you to do real things. Kerbal Space Program just made the science accessible. And that accessibility can make the next step easier to reach, more obvious, you know, more within your reach, so to speak. So the next time you encounter somebody that thinks that video games are just for entertainment purposes, you can tell them the story of a 15-year-old kid who built a satellite in his bedroom after being inspired by a video game. Or perhaps you yourself were thinking about building a satellite in your bedroom. Who knows? Look, even if it never gets to space, you will still teach yourself useful skills. It's really good to dabble and look beyond video games. But I'll be wishing Matt the best of luck next week. Until then, I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe. <laughs>